Sick. All right, man. Well, welcome to the podcast. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Yeah, sweet deal. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, so, yeah, for those uh, listening who don't know you, you uh, own and run Black Octopus Sound, correct? Yep. Yeah, I'm co-owner and uh, second in command next to Toby em- Emerson, who's the CEO and founder. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah, um, yeah I'm curious because, I mean, I've known you for a long time now, like since 2012 or something. Um, and at that time, you were making music under the name Tantric Dex. I'm curious, like, how you, uh, like, pivoted from that into, like, full-time sample creation. Yeah, I think, like, most producers, I uh, had this burning passion and dream to become a self-employed music producer. And uh, as kind of, like, a young kid trying to figure it out, uh, one of my strategies was looking to create multiple streams of income, you know, like releasing tracks d- didn't pay very much and playing shows was like relatively inconsistent. So I was, I was always looking for other ways to, to kind of beef out my, my financial portfolio a little bit. And, uh, so I took on jobs like mass mixing and mastering for clients and, uh, music production education. And, uh, one day Toby, probably about a year after Black Octopus opened the doors, he approached me and was like, hey, you want to make a sample pack? And I was like, yeah, sweet. I'm a hell yes to this. And so I produced my first sample pack. It took me about three months. And then when it finally hit the shelf, after like it, the product had been live for about three weeks, and then I got my first royalty payout. And I was like, oh, this is legit. And... Uh, yeah, so I I jumped on board uh, and started started working on more projects with Toby and Black Octopus, and uh, a couple of years went by, and there was just this like really beautiful kind of perfect storm that happened in my world, where uh, just this like really really dynamite financial alignment happened, and after working in the sample pack industry for a couple of years now. I, I, my North star at the time was actually to start my own sample label. And, uh, I was talking about it with some friends and kind of seeking counsel about it for, and with some other people in the music industry. And Toby was one of them. I let him in on the idea that I was like, Hey man, just wanted to again, give you a heads up that I think I'm going to go start my own sample label. And, uh, I got as far as like having the name and the branding and like had everything dialed. And then, uh, a close personal friend of both mine and Toby's, uh, kind of just came out of the woodwork a little bit and kind of like gave my head a shake a little bit. And he's like, dude, instead of competing with Toby and starting your own brand, why don't you take the investment capital that you have and put it into black octopus instead and become his business partner? And I was like, oh, yeah, maybe there's something to that. So I had a meeting with Toby about it and yeah, tabled, tabled the idea and the vision. And, uh, we kind of got into the weeds about what a partnership would look like and ultimately found a place where it was just like a mutual no brainer. Hell yes. And kind of way we went. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, what was the first pack you made that you, it was called orgasmic glitch hop. It was a glitch hop okay. sample pack. It was ri- mm-hmm. it was fairly cl- fairly close to when I la- first launched the Tantric Dex project. Oh, gotcha. Okay, yeah, I had the same sort of um, thought when I got my first revenue stream, uh, my first check from Splice. I was like, oh wow, this is much better than music. <laughs> you can make a lot more money from samples than you do from music. That's for sure. Yeah. Depends, though. I mean, if you're Skrillex, obviously, you're making a lot more off music than samples, most likely. Yeah. So if he did put out a sample pack, it'd probably make him a shitload of money as well. Yeah. But yeah, I agree. I mean, it's important, I think, if you want to do music for a full-time job, that you be flexible about the jobs that you do to make money. Like, a lot of people are like, I, don't, I want to do nothing but make ambient music on my modular rig, and I want that to be, like, my life, my life's work, and I'm going to make money like that. And it's like, yeah good luck. You're probably going to have to do a couple other things there to, to make it work. Yeah, There's very few people who can make a, a living off that. So yeah, I've, I've done the same thing. I've like, <clears throat> as my, I make music basically primarily every day, but to obviously make it all work, I do a bunch of other stuff too, like shows and uh, educational content and stuff as well. Mm-hmm. What was the name of the sample company that you were going to start if you didn't join Black Octopus? eruptive sound that had this volcanic Mm. eruption kind of a theme Mm, cool yeah um so like what's your day-to-day look like now that you're um like full-time at black octopus or i assume you're full-time yeah 
Just give me one second here, Bill. Yeah, no worries. Is your cat going nuts? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what's your, uh, what's your day-to-day look like? Like what generally, how does your day look, um, working full-time at a sample company? You know, it, I think this is, uh, uh, I got, I have a, I have a funny answer for you. Um, there, there's like a running joke internally amongst the Black Octopus leadership team that uh, we we got into this business to be sound designers and really make a living out of our craft. And we're, we're at a point now where the business has scaled so much that we have a team of over 100 artists on our roster. Uh, we're slowly approaching our fifth hundred sample, 500 sample pack. And, um, so there's, there's a lot to hold and manage. You know, we have a Mm full-time social media manager, marketing manager, a team of staff who run operations for us. And so, uh, in the beginning we were doing sound design nonstop, like eight, 10, 12 hours a day. And now we kind of joke that we're like glorified email answerers. <laughs> I was over at Toby's house the other day where he was showing me his new music room where he's like beefed out this other room in his house that's full of all of his music gear. And I made a joke. I was like, so now you have your music studio and then your email answering room. <laughs> <laughs> so there's just a lot of people to coordinate with, right? And, you know, people reach out to us all the time wanting to engage with us, whether it's a new artist who wants to develop a sample pack or another sample pack label that wants to be implemented into our into our distribution system. Uh, yeah, there's 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 a lot uh, a lot of moving parts. There's like a million small details to handle every day and a lot of it happens over email or um yeah, digital text communication with our staff. Um it's 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 very intellectual labor heavy actually because there's just so many moving parts and if one part breaks down like a, a a graphic doesn't get dialed for an artwork all of a sudden we have a conversa a new conversation that comes out of the woodwork that's in the form of an unhappy artist who's like a little bit pissed about the artwork that's been presented for their pack and doesn't meet their own branding desires or standards and you know so like things like that come up all the time you know and um yeah. So my day to day is uh, one of the first things I do is look at my communications to see if there's anything that's kind of nine one one needs my attention. Um, I'm also super blessed to be in the position where we have a team of staff who are just stoked to work with us, and um, yeah, they're just super enthusiastic, and and um, it's just like such a huge privileged place to be in uh, that I treasure and don't take for granted. And uh, it affords me the opportunity to kind of work on bigger picture items. So one of one of my big responsibilities uh, is uh, secondary to making sure that operations are dialed every day is finding ways to expand and grow the business kind of from a top level big picture perspective. So um, I'm I'm spearheading the implementation of three new product offerings that are going to expand our business beyond our current sample pack business right now. So. Nice. Yeah. Um, are you going to get into potentially making like plugins or software or anything like that? We actually just released our first plugin. It's called GTAR. Okay. GTAR. And I haven't seen yeah. this one. What does it do? Uh, it's it's a guitar plugin, and it's yeah. it's 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 tar- It's it's kind of a one trick pony that does what it does extremely well. It makes mm. guitar centric pads, atmospheres, plucks that are spectacular for cinematic or ambient down tempo kind of flavors of music production. Mm. Uh, it's just so great for adding like organic, alive feeling pads, drones, things like that. Mm. And what was the process like making a plugin? Were you basically like, I have this idea for a plugin, and so I'm going to start reaching out to developers and figure out who can make it, and then basically like work on the like a, on a dev version of the plugin until like you're happy with the sound and they can f- fully skin it, or like what, how did that work? Yeah, that's a great question. And for me, I got to give just an infinite tip of the hat to Tom, who's uh, Tom Calvert, who designed the plugin. He's one of a one of our. He's a longtime Black Octopus staff member who's actually uh, w- part of a, a very popular music production duo right now. They're just totally blowing up. Uh, their 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 duo is called Voe, 
and uh, they just got signed an exclusive deal to Viper Recordings. And if for anyone who knows the drum and bass scene, um, the, the name Viper Recordings is right at the top there. So i um, super stoked for them. Tom is just an absolute genius. You know, his music production is just absolutely stellar. It's crisp. It's super musical and expressive. And uh, I honestly can't sing Tom's praises enough. And uh, his his partner, his wife, Jess, actually supported him in the plugin development too because she's um, big into video and graphics. And so they are, they're like a power couple. They both work for Black Octopus. Jess runs our marketing and social media. And they work together to build the plugin. So Tom, Tom learned uh, the coding for it just because he wanted to make his own plugin. And, oh, wow. So um, he had never coded before that. Yeah, no. Wow. Yeah, so he just kind of came out of nowhere with like, "Hey guys, I'm working on this plugin. Let's make it happen." And so we're like, <laughs> "Yeah, great. Let's let's go." Nice. And you plan to do more plugins with him or with other developers? Yeah, yeah. Plugin development is is definitely something that's been alive internally for us for a few years, and um, there's a, a thing or two cooking on the stove there that uh, would be premature for me to reveal. True. Uh, this also might be premature for you to reveal, but, um, have you looked into AI stuff and, and things that you can do there? Uh, I have a little bit and, uh, admittedly, there's a part of me that feels like I'm a little bit behind the curve a little bit. And, um, yeah, there's, I'm I'm hungry to do, to do the, the homework that I need to, to really engage it. Um, like what, what's actually interesting for me is, is including like the moral and ethical parts of the conversation too, you know, Mm -hmm. because there's, um, I, I saw this one. I saw this one meme about AI recently that kind of struck a resonant note for me, and it was uh, the, the the early visions for for uh, automation, robotics, and AI was to have the this technology come in and make people's lives easier by having these these things do things that are very difficult or annoying or undesirable for people to do, and therefore potentially opening up the spaciousness in their lives so that they can actually follow their passions and pursuits and do what's really deeply meaningful to them. And there's kind of like an irony where like uh, lines of work, like art, artistic forms of work, like graphic design, music production, even videos, filmmaking, cinema production, uh, this technology is doing such a bomb job that it's actually compromising people's positions that, that they're in, that they've worked really hard to get to. So, um, what we're, what, what's happening in some spaces is that people who are artists now are actually finding that their jobs are being compromised, that they've worked so hard to build themselves to. And in order for them to kind of keep their revenue alive, they actually have to go back and do those unfulfilling forms of work just to kind of make ends meet. So have you got I, an I know example you're big of, on the AI train, so I would actually, yeah, I'm curious, have you got an example of like an artist who's had to go back to doing unfulfilling stuff because AI has destroyed their career? Yeah, I for r- right now um right now from what I've seen firsthand and the people that I've spoken to is it hasn't fully actualized and materialized there but there seems to be a consensus at least in the people that I've spoken to in my circles that there is a fear of that happening and people right, are kind of like batten happened, down right? batten down the hatches a little bit kind of uh getting ready for uh, an an upcoming storm potentially so yeah but i don't think it has happened yet and i'm personally i think that it's uh at the moment it's a positive tool like for instance maybe not for a sample pack company i can see (laughs) how it wouldn't be for a sample pack company because even right now there's tools out there such as dance diffusion where you can train a model on a like a folder of sounds and it can just generate like iterations and it sounds like those um uh, like really quickly you know for instance i trained a whole folder uh, a whole model on a folder of bases that virtual riot made and then i trained another model on a folder of bases that i made and then i made a 50 50 blend of the two and it generated like a ton of really sick bases so i basically don't have to do sound design anymore which is great because i i like doing sound design but if i can not do it and I can just make sounds that way, then I'll definitely do that. So I can just concentrate on the writing portion of it, which I think opens up your brain a lot to 
not getting stuck down in the weeds as much. So I think it's positive there. The other thing I think it's positive for is stimulating creativity. So another thing that happens to me sometimes is I'll sit down in the studio and I'll go like, all right, I'm going to write a piece of music. And then I start and I'm like, well, shit, what do I do? What's the idea, you know? Um, and AI is really good at like generating these really short, like three to four second or three to five second clips of just like these little ideas. And I find that that sometimes can spark some sort of creativity in me where I'm like, oh shit, that gives me an idea. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. Um, and the other point I want to make is like, how many times in your life have you ever heard uh, a song and been like, I wouldn't change anything about that song. That song's perfect. Like, I think that's happened to me like never, basically. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't see AI really ever creating something that I wouldn't change either. And I still think the the artistic decision to put what sounds you want to like curate in that folder that you train the model on is going to generate you some unique models. Plus, uh, like anything you create from it, you're probably going to change to some degree anyway. And I think those that don't, who just spit shit out of AI and don't change anything about it and then just put it on the internet and think that it's cool, you probably like just the same as today like if somebody goes and uses a bunch of presets and a bunch of loops and just throws them together and goes and puts them out like you can kind of tell it just doesn't sound as polished and cool as somebody who like has spent the time to go and finesse everything in their own particular way to create their own sounding like unique thing yeah but i can see for a sample pack company it can be scary for sure because right now you have a sample generator <laughs> that's just going to spit out. Like it, like you can train a whole thing on the Leviathan pack. or You wouldn't train it on the whole pack because um, you have to curate the folders properly. Because if you train something on an entire pack that has hi-hats, kick drums, snares, pads, like all sorts of shit, then the average of all that is basically white noise, right? So you have to be like careful about this, the folders that you train it on. You have to train it on like just hi-hats and then like just kicks and only specific types of kicks. Or like if you train it on every kick, like a live kick, an EDM kick, a side trance kick, a you know, house kick or whatever, you're going to get like the average of all of those. So I think there, there comes some like artistic merit in like curating those folders really well and being like, all right, I want like 80% side trance kicks and then like I'll put 20% like house kicks in there or something to see what happens. But I mean... Yeah, I've thought, like, one thought I've had is companies like yours or Splices, you really have the upper hand in terms of training models because right now you have, like, the largest sample collections, basically. So you have, like, these m basically massive data sets to train models on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Have you yeah, considered that, like, potentially, like, yeah. training models and perhaps selling the model files? Because I, I kind of have thought that that's maybe where things will go. Instead of selling a sample... Uh, you'll sell like a like a Psytrance kick model made off like a certain artist or something. And then you can download that model, throw it into the thing and be like, generate me like a thousand of these. Or even in real time, it could generate them perhaps if you use the Ray Verkam model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything that you've just said is super compelling. And, and I, would, I would tend to agree with everything that you've said. You know, I think when it comes to the AI, AI conversation, there's, there's, there's a light side to it and a shadow side to it. And uh, I think there's potential for it to be just a ridiculous service and convenience to, to humanity and artistic pursuits. And, and I also think that there's going to be some casualties in its wake that we'll see. And um, yeah, it's like, it's paradoxically, it'll be like a bit of a blessing and a curse. And, and, and I think like the way that you're, the, the way that you're thinking about it is, is, is really healthy. You know, it's about really leveraging it in a way that's like really of service to you and, and your music and your artistry. And, um, you know, also kind of like what you've spoken to, it's like there, there's kind of a lazy way to do it too, where like just everything's done for you. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to weed more of that out though. Because just like the deep fakes where, um, you know, if you just see a video online now of Donald Trump or whatever, or Joe Biden just saying some like totally outrageous shit, I, I personally am like more uh, likely these days than I was in the past to be like, is that fake or is that real? You know, like gets me more critically thinking. Yeah. And I feel like some degree of that could perhaps apply to art as well, where if someone's listening to that, like, is that fake art or is that good art? Yeah. Yeah. Something that I see intimately is the, is the human propensity for laziness in music production. Something that we have to deal with on a regular basis with Black Octopus is uh, it's very common for one of our artists 
to approach approach us and say, hey, somebody released the demo track to my sample pack on Spotify as their own song. And all of a sudden we're in a situation where we have to file a DMC takedown notice with Spotify in order to get our demo track off of someone else's artist profile. This happens all the time. But the, the demo the track? The demo so I have track. A few, I have a few questions about this because Notlo also uh, did this recently. And she like took some ghost syndicate pack and basically like released the demo track. And it was out for a while before somebody figured out that it was the demo track of this thing. And then there was this whole drama on Twitter and shit where everyone was shitting on her. Um, but I'm curious, like, could that track that somebody have put on Spotify or whatever, was it comprised of like loops in this pack? Or is it like a pretty dialed in demo track where it's like the, the likelihood of remaking that is like very low? It's quite literally the so when when people download one of our sample packs inside the folder they'll get the samples or presets of course they'll also get a copy of the graphic the license agreement and the demo track that we've produced for the pack and so the occasions that I'm speaking about are very specifically occasions where they've taken the demo track that's been produced on our side for the product and they just nick the demo track and upload it to their Spotify. It's quite literally the demo track from the pack. Not even like a reconfiguration yeah. of the samples from the pack. It's the demo track. Huh. And yeah. Actually, yeah, on, what a, is it? on a similar it note. It seems like a, like a somewhat gray area though, right? If you, but unless you say it in the license agreement that they obviously oh, it's, can't. Oh, it's, it's clear in the license agreement. Yeah, it's, it's, there's, there's, there's no gray, at least on our side. Um, <clears throat> something that has happened before that was quite controversial is for a while we were developing and selling Ableton live templates on our site too. They're still up there and available. Um, so a producer bought one of our Ableton templates, a royalty free Ableton template used the template for a remix competition. And quite literally all they did was take the vocals from the track that was being remixed for the competition, inserted into the template and basically just slapped a limit limiter on the master in a way like the track was already mastered. So the process of adding another limiter just totally crushed the tune and it won a remix competition. Oh, wow. And so all of a sudden out of nowhere, we're getting emails from all of these super pissed music producers who are like, what? Some dude used your template to win a competition. This is bullshit. So the template is like a, like a written track inside Ableton to just sort of show what a finished written track in Ableton might look like. Exactly. Yeah. Full, full completed track from front to back. Hmm. And what's the legality on that? Is that illegal? Well, technically not. <laughs> so was that person not. just it's a, a galaxy that was just a that was a galaxy brain strap from that producer to be honest <laughs> yeah <laughs> was it legal? lazy yes definitely artistic legal. not very much but galaxy yeah. brain hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah what legal, did he win from yes, the sample ethical, pack? Like, probably questionable yeah what what was the uh the prize that he won uh, i don't remember this is probably five years ago or something like that hmm damn <laughs> that's pretty funny though yeah so what do you produce much or or sound design much anymore or is your job pretty much shifted towards the business you know um a little bit of both i uh i've been slowly percolating a new artist project actually in the last five years that's um a, a different sound than what i was doing with the tantric dex project oh cool uh, yeah yeah. Ultimately, I found that what, uh, with the Tantric Dex project, it was really fun. Um, I had a really great time, a really great run. Um, was was enjoying getting booked in cities all over North America. I never made it across across the the oceans to perform with it, but um, definitely got booked for a good amount of shows in Canada and the United States with it. And I got to a point where um, I was playing a show in the U.S. and it was like my time slot was like three thirty to four thirty a.m. and and I found myself just like playing tunes to a bunch of like high 18 year olds. And I like just noticed that like I was super blessed to be in, in the, in the lane that I was in, but just not happy. And, and I, f I found that I kind of like at the level of self-development outgrew uh, the community that was around that project and just wasn't feeling nourished. I was feeling more drained by, by, by getting bookings like that. So I wanted to, 
kind of kind of take a step back and, and create something that felt a little bit more resonant and a little bit more in alignment with who I am that um, yeah, is beyond making like trippy bass music for mm. for people to take drugs to. Yeah, there is a period of that that is like very, you need like some like resilience to get through. I definitely had that as well where I played a lot of shitty sets to shitty crowds. Like I appreciated the people that were there, but it like was not fun for me and it was draining for sure. I know what you mean. I did that for a long time and I think like it's only really in the last like maybe three years or something, basically since Phantasmagoria came out that that stuff sort of changed and the shows have been getting like like you know, inspiring me and and stuff like that. So yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, it's hard cool. to like to deal with that draining feeling that you can get from playing shows and touring and stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm glad that you're starting a new project. What's it called? Sacred Fire. Okay, cool. And what genre is it? Still glitch hop or is it like kind of different? Yeah, it's a hybrid of a few different sounds. Uh, it's primarily Indian instrument driven. Uh, for anyone who knows me, who's known me for a long time, has known that I've had a, a, a strong inclination and enthusiasm for Eastern spiritual traditions and wisdom traditions. And so, um, yeah, there's just like something super mystical about Indian instruments that adds a certain character to, to tunes that I really love and treasure. And, uh, I also, I also deeply appreciate, uh, the kind of like theme and quality of cinematic music. That's really about being like emotionally evocative, whether it's like creating tension or drama or, um, some type of like cathartic release away from that tension and drama. So I've been including a lot of cinematic uh, elements in my music too, and then then big bass, whether it's a glitch hop tune or a trap or a dubstep tune. Yeah, nice. And do you have any like rules for the writing process for this project? I find sometimes, like, I feel like if I was going to start a new project, I would create rules for it because the Mr. Bill project basically has no rules. And I feel like that can be a problem sometimes. (laughs) So I tried to start a project once where I was like, I'm going to give it rules where like every sound has to be like created from my modular synth. And uh, there was some other rule I can't remember, but every sound had to come from my modular rig. And I made like two tunes that way. And then I was like, oh, fuck this. And I just went back to do a Mr. Pill stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Sort of your like boundless, reckless, whimsical, free-flowing Mr. Bill Styles. Yeah, I just I don't like rule like I feel like rules are important to start a track or to start a project, but I feel like you have to break them pretty quickly after you're like in the flow. Yeah. I think you, if you can do anything, it gets hard to to figure out what to do. Like if if anything is possible, it's like, well shit, what direction do I go? And I feel like I get option paralysis a little bit. Yeah, yeah, you know, like creating like self-imposed limitations. There's a wisdom to that sometimes. Um, as, as it pertains to 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 setting rules, something that I've actually been super big into the last three or four years. It's, it was kind of my uh, my pandemic passion project was taking on learning filmmaking, and um, that's something that I'm feeling super turned on in, in life about right now is is filmmaking. And there's like all of these rules, right? There's like uh, like. F- photography composition principles that are recommended and lighting principles and yeah, audio principles. And there's kind of like a methodology to all of that. And it kind of puts you into like this little box of rules and structure, which is super helpful because it's there. They're there for a reason. They guide you to create a beautiful image that sounds good at the same time. But also there, there's moments where it's super appropriate to break those rules too. And, and I think like the thing about having self-imposed rules is uh it's great because it creates a frame or a structure for you and some people really thrive in that you know like the analogy that comes to mind is like the, every river needs a riverbank otherwise it's just like floods and creates chaos and destruction all over the place but every riverbank also needs a river there needs to be like that creative juice and aliveness that rushes through and kind of brings life to to all the land so you know there's like i think there's a, the tandem of the river bank and the river is is a, analogous for creating rules and structure but also mm-hmm. uh i think when, if you're going to break a rule and not just do it for the sake of breaking a rule, but to know exactly why you're breaking it. 
Like right. that's something that I've advocated for with, with my students who, who uh, in music production in particular, who would just kind of go in and kind of get into their stream, their stream and current of, of production and just kind of get into the flow. And all of a sudden they're like making decisions. And I would, I would ask them like, why did you do that? Uh, and oft, so oft more times than not, I would get like a, Oh, I don't know. It just seemed like the thing to do. And for me, like something that I advocate for is actually making deeply deliberate decisions that are in service to something rather than just kind of like flicking switches and knobs and just kind of winging it. Like make if you're going to make a decision, like be very clear and deliberate about what that decision is in service to. Yeah, I think that's extremely important for mixing and mastering and <clears throat> for writing and sound design, especially sound design. I think you have to throw that rule completely out the window. Like I think the best sounds that I've ever made have come from doing things at random and then all of a sudden I've got this crazy thing going on, this crazy patch that I don't really even know how it works. And I'm like, oh wow, this is sounding cool. And then I'll go back through and like figure out why it works and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, definitely for mixing and mastering. I've been mixing a new album recently and chasing my own tail with it a lot, to be honest, for that reason. Because <laughs> I haven't like done things in specific deliberate ways i've kind of just gone into it being like this sounds good this sounds good and like trying to get well i guess the reason was i thought it sounded good at the time but um yeah it's really important for sure i feel like in the future when i mix down tunes i'm gonna like the first thing i'm gonna do is like set the session up for a mix not like leave it how it was when i wrote it because i feel like the way i write is like very messy it's just like i throw shit everywhere and and then get some sort of result but the way I'm, and then if I try to mix like that, like the gain structuring is all fucked up and all that kind of stuff. You know, speaking of rules, do you know Matthew Herbert? Have you heard of this guy? No. Nope. He has a personal contract for uh, writing music. It is, uh, it's 11 rules. It's the use of, uh, no, oh, wait, hold on. The use of sounds that exist already is not allowed. Uh, so no drum machines, no synthesizers or no presets only sounds that are generated at the start of the compositional process or taken from the artist's own previously unused archive are available for sampling. The sampling of other people's music is strictly forbidden. No replication of traditional acoustic instruments is allowed where the financial and physical possibility of using the real one exists. The inclusion, development, propagation, existence, replication, acknowledgement, rights, patterns, and beauty of what are commonly known as accidents is encouraged. And furthermore, they have equal rights within the composition as deliberate, conscious, or premeditated compositional ac actions or decisions. The mixing desk is not to be reset before the start of a new track in order to apply random EQ and effect settings across the new sounds. Once the ordering and the recording of the new music has begun, the desk may be used as normal. All effects settings must be edited. No factory preset or pre-programmed patches are allowed. Samples themselves are not to be truncated from the rear. Revealing parts of the recording are invariably stored there. A notation of sounds used to be taken and made public. A list of technical equipment used to be made public. And optional remixes should be completed using only the sounds provided by the original artist. That's his, that's his rules. <laughs> that's 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 kind of amazing i'm like cheek, cheek very cheekily wondering if he's a drum and bass producer well he can't be right because he's saying no truncating samples from the rear which means like if he drags in a drum sample he can't shorten them at all which drum and bass producers basically need to do yeah, um, like actually kind of to, to 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 kind of contradict that a little bit um, something that i find over and over especially when we release drum and bass sample packs is uh, it, it's actually kind of hilarious and and ironic when you really look at it. There's there's an attitude amongst the drum and bass production community that sample packs are like basically illegal. It's like you need hmm. to be like doing your own sound design. Everything needs to be completely original. Like sample packs are are villainized in in the drum and bass scene heavily. It's kind of funny though because like a lot of drum and bass sounds basically exactly the same. And it's like based off of the Amen break, right? So it's right. like, like the genre was literally born from sampling a record. So it's it's just yeah, it's, the irony is not lost on me. It's kind of entertaining. So if sample packs aren't used in the drum and bass world, have you released any drum and bass sample packs? 
you know we we have and uh, uh I, I think by and large there's like uh like a particularly amongst kind of the veteran drum and bass producers that there's like a kind of like like kind of like the old old stock drum and bass producers from like the late 90s or early 2000s 90s and early 2000s um it's it's gra- it's definitely more accepted now than it has been in the past but there's still those people who kind of like snobbly stick their nose in the air to the thought of using a sample pack like when we promote a sample pack on like the dogs on acid forum for example it's not it's not uncommon for us to get a comment of someone being like ugh peh, sample packs <laughs> You should make your own original sounds, but but how do the how do the sales go on the DMB uh, sample packs? Do they, they reflect they do the okay. opinion? Or we sell drum okay. and bass sample packs and we keep releasing them. So yeah, so yeah. There's 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 drum definitely drum and bass producers are definitely uh, using. Uh, I'm I'm wondering if the people who use sample packs would actually admit it though to their drum and bass I mean, producer homies. Noisia just released a sample pack. And they're like the the drum and bass like the drum and bass guys. Yeah. Yeah, and that like was the drum and bass vets too. They like they've been around forever. That was a huge surprise to me. Actually, I had a conversation with one of the guys from Noisia at Amsterdam dance event a few years ago, and was talking to them about um, about making a sample pack with Black Octopus. And there was like this attitude of like we would never give away our sounds. They're like our prized hmm. possessions. And and I think like when you get to that level uh, of an act, like what you do is proprietary. So. I thought it was, you know, both a very beautiful and surprising thing to see them very generously give away their their own proprietary intellectual property that is kind of like their claim to fame in their sound design, right? When did you say this was? Uh, it would have been Amsterdam dance event, probably 2018. So I wonder if they had decided to quit Noisia by then, because I feel like part of the reason, maybe, and this is like maybe just my cynical brain thinking right now, is that like they were about to end the project, so they were like, "All right, fuck it, let's milk it for like everything else that it can do." Yeah. So they did like <laughs> yeah. one more album, like one more tour, one give away a sample. Like they were just trying to get like every bit of money out of the brand as possible. I don't know. That's just my cynical mind. Yeah, I yeah, that that, 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 that thought I, definitely occurred to me too. Yeah, I had Tice on the podcast actually not long ago. I should have asked him. Yeah, uh, he's an interesting dude, man. He's cool. Which yeah. was the, did you meet him or was it somebody it else? Yeah. yeah, okay. I feel like now that they've all like split, you can kind of tell who was like doing the parts of Noise here that you thought was really sick. And I feel <laughs> like, you know, like no- Tyus is making like all this sort of like weird break and like ambient sort of stuff. And then like Nick Sleepnet is like doing the real technical shit. I love both, but yeah, the, the stuff that uh, Nick is doing is quite next level. Yeah, I had the same experience when the glitch mops glitch mob split for a time and Edit started doing his own thing and Craddy started doing his own thing. <clears throat> Craddy was Craddy in the glitch mob? Yeah, I believe I it was Ua and Beretta, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Not not Craddy. Yeah, I made a mistake there. <laughs> yeah. Uh Ua is doing a cool project now with um this artist called Marauder. Not the same Marauder as the dubstep uh Marauder is a different one. And it's pretty cool. It's called Secret Tape and worth checking out <clears throat> um so yeah what you what do you got going on uh, for the rest of the year or like what's your what what plans can you reveal or what are you excited about yeah so we're we're just about to launch a new offering that is going to be uh the black octopus entrance into the video education space and um, so it's something that we've been working on uh, for quite a long time. Uh, we've built a whole new wing to our website to accommodate it and house it. Uh, it looks, it looks, it looks so beautiful. I'm just, yeah, like the visual side of it is just, it looks so sexy. I'm very, very happy with how it looks. And um, so, yeah, we're going to be having some video education kind of focused offerings, both in the form of courses as well as live webinars that are going to be housed inside our platform. Uh, as well as some other super sweet goodies that are going to come along with uh, with that product. Uh, the the current name of the product is is Black Octopus Gold, and um, yeah, we'll see if we commit to that name for for the launch. But that's the working title, and uh, we're just about to launch. Uh, so one of our flag our flagship product with Black Octopus is the Leviathan series, mm-hmm. and so we've been branching out, making kind of Leviathan style sample packs that are genre targeted and focused. So we have one right now that's pretty much ready to go for uh, the tech 
the tech community. So it's like very much like techno, dub techno and tech house focused. Um, and it's like a 5,000 sample pack for yeah. just one genre. Yeah. Wow. It's yeah. a lot of work, man. <laughs> like I made a 1,300 sample pack uh, during COVID and that shit took me like months. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. And for a lot of these samples, do you think that they're made bespoke for the pack or do you think that the people who are making these samples are like digging through their archives and like finding the shit in their tracks that, that could be used for it? Because I mean, they still own that, right? Or do you think like everything is made from scratch? Most of it's made from scratch. I do, when we do engage a new artist, especially if they're a brand new sound designer, I do encourage them to go through their project files from tracks they produced and find things that they that they have made from scratch. And, um, yeah, either they include those samples or they use the, use them as base material to make something new out of mm. Some, something that's, that we really, really drive home is, um, to make sure that the sound, the sounds that do go into our packs are in fact made from scratch, um, at some point or another, um, for, for copyright reasons. Uh, it's just it's so common in the sample industry to see situations where someone uses um, something from somewhere that they're not supposed to, like uh, a, a certain pack that uh, used a contact patch. It was like quite literally like the C3 note of like a base patch in a contact library that was really popular. And mm, which so, pack was this? Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to mention names. Uh, okay. Yeah, it was it was a it was a very 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 high profile sample pack. Oh really? And on a very 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 high profile or... platform. Was it just that sound that got taken out then, or was it the whole pack that ended up getting taken down? Uh, the whole pack didn't end up getting taken down for sure. It's still up there, okay. but uh, I, I imagine there was an internal investigation around it. Hmm. Yeah, you know the thing the thing the thing is is like it's so tempting for producers to find something that's already been made that already sounds good and just like add a compressor to it or something like that and right. and you know kind of declare that it's an original sound or because it's different or slightly indistinguishable and you know I, I guess the way that we look at it is like this is our business that we're protecting right it's like there's like a an integrity piece you know we want to know we want the people that we work with like the splices and the loop masters and the adsr sounds the sonic academies all of them to know that we're that we're providing legitimate projects uh, products that we've made from scratch that are uh, highly uh, have a high level of legal integrity and um, so this is something that we take super seriously. Uh, I've, se I've seen it. I've seen I've seen sample labels go down because they um, uh, some someone finds uh, a snippet of a vocal sample from an acapella from like an eight nineteen eighties pop tune, and they take this snippet from a vocal acapella and then they like turn it into they use it in their sound design somehow and it's like hey this actually sounds like this like whitney houston song from the 1980s or something like that and it's like well damn. How, how do you like surely there's a level at where the sample gets different enough that you could have started with a sample from a pack and process it in such a way that it is a new sound right like technically and yep. objectively it's a new yeah sound. of course yeah of course yeah that's totally doable you know i could like take a sound from like the mr bill sample pack on splice and like crush the shit out of a kick drum and then put it into a sample pack, and you. And that's like totally legal, right? Uh, no, it's not. It's not legal. Uh, well, it, actually, it depends on the on the license agreement, right? Like that's. Well, and, like okay, so let's <laughs> say like I take a, like I could take a thing from Leviathan, right, and put like so much processing on it that it becomes some like eleven second thing of like artifacts and glitches and shit, and then like there's no fucking way in the in hell that anyone would be able to tell that it's a kick drum from a Leviathan pack, but that's still not legal. Correct. Yeah. That's it depends. It depends on the license agreement though, right? Like this is something mm -hmm. that we run into all the time. Um, so here's another example. We had, we had this, uh, this artist, uh, artist project. There's, there's three guys in a project. It's a very, very, very high profile, uh, name in the industry. And they delivered a sample pack and a lot of the samples were made with East West sample instruments. And we had to reject the pack because, of the the license agreement of of East West products very clearly states you're not allowed to make sample libraries with 
with using their instruments and recordings as a base material. Like mm-hmm. their recordings that are in their instruments are like their it's their intellectual property. And so for us to kind of take that and use it and make a sample pack out of it is against their license agreement and a legal basis for, for them to file a lawsuit. So mm-hmm. this is, it's a conversation we have with absolutely every single one of our artists that, that we have like a whole list of instruments that cannot be used to make black octopus sample packs. East West is definitely on the list. Contact libraries are off the table and even Rompler instruments like Nexus or Omnisphere or anything that uses uh, like F expansion, BFD, or like tune track easy drummer like all of those are off the table for sound design for black octopus packs because their license agreements strictly prohibit their intellectual property being used to right but there's, there is a waste. point at which you just would not get caught right like if you put so much processing on it, there's no way to it, like... exactly like if you stretch a, a kick drum out so that it's 11 seconds long and turn it into something completely different uh it's it's very 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 unlikely one would get caught very, very right. unlikely. To, like, it's quite easy to make a sample completely unrecognizable. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I understand that it's like technically illegal, but like on a personal ethical level, and I feel the same way about AI too. I think like if you're not fucking anyone over, then it's fine. Like we're in a crazy gray area with AI right now, where it's like if I train a model on like a Leviathan pack and then all of a sudden make a ton of samples that sound exactly like that and then sell it, then yeah, that would be unethical because it's kind of fucking you guys over. But if I make like a, a sample pack using some Leviathan, like a model, like an AI model using some Leviathan samples, some of my own, some of something else, some of something else, and I make something completely unique that doesn't really sound like Leviathan stuff at all, and then I sell that, and it's like to a completely different market of sample users and stuff like that, then I feel like it's not fucking you over. And ethically, I feel like that's it's still a gray area, but I think ethically that's that seems more okay to me than the than the former. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear that. Um, so kind of like a slight remix on that conversation, I'd be curious about your perspective about something that I know is quite unpopular in the graphic design community is that a lot of AI-generated graphics happen because uh, their AI mechanism, their AI technology scans other artists' work and yeah, uses so other music. artists' work to kind of configure a new image. Literally all AI is like this. It has to be trained on some sort of data set to, to do its thing. Yeah. So like it's, it's controversial in the graphic design community because it's like if, if there was a human out there that by hand went out and researched other people's artwork and made a new image that was copying other people's artwork, it would be like ethically not okay. And because like that whole idea with art is to like create something new and original and have something like kind of be like an expression of your soul, you know, it's. But even if that is the, the core idea of art, that's never exactly what we're doing. We're taking all of the influences of everything that we've looked at in our life and everything that we've liked and disliked. And we're making our ideal combination of all those things, which is exactly what AI does is a bunch of weights and biases. And it weighs and biases things up to figure out like the average of all of those things and then produces something like that, which is literally exactly what we do in our brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I'm enjoying the the richness of this discussion, kind of getting into the weeds and nuances of it. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I I definitely have looked at it, but I I started looking at AI in the same way that you are looking at it right now when I first started getting into it, and the more I got into it, and the more I learned about it, the more I was like, yeah, this is fine. It's literally just a tool. I don't think it's like destroying anyone, and I don't think at any point will it destroy art because, like I said, there's no point at which like I've ever heard a song that I wouldn't change at all. So I think like the artist is still going to have to give their human input and. Like their their weights and biases as to what is good about the AI generated thing and what is not and change things or generate multiple things and splice them all together. The thing that I think is going to be really cool is like, for instance, to get to the point at where you are at sound design right now has taken you your entire life or your entire producing life, like 15 years or something, right? But all of a sudden now, somebody who just knows how to use dance diffusion can be as good a sound designer as you or me. But we can be a good a programmer as somebody who's been programming for 20 years using chat GPT pretty much. Maybe not quite as good, but like most of the way there. Yeah. Or somebody who wants to generate like visual images or video 
uh, all of a sudden is as good as like people, you know, almost like 3D stuff. Obviously not quite as good, but like you get you get the gist. Like all of a sudden, it doesn't take five or six lifetimes to be extremely good at five or six things. You can be extremely good at uh, five, or you have five or six skill sets available to you via AI within the span of like maybe a month or two it might take you to learn how to use the AI tools. So all of a sudden, this like medium combination becomes available, you know, like what, what am I going to do if I'm a pro coder, a pro video, uh, 3D creator, a professional graphic designer, a professional music maker and sound designer? It's like, what combination does that create? Um, and I feel like that's going to be the exciting thing once all of these tools reach their full potential is what people choose to do with the combination of all of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like all of a sudden you're going to get these like next level AV shows or like crazy installations or like, I think the art is just going to get way more insane. Yeah. 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 I feel like that. making a track on a computer these days is going to be like the equivalent to somebody like playing a solo guitar piece, you know? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The potential is super, so. super know. exciting. Um, I, I want, I want to skirt back to the ethical conversation j just a little bit because because yeah. you you uh compared um ai using a data set to influence uh, a final product and right. and the stance that you're taking is that's like completely fine and ethical well it's what we do so i think it's no different or it's not very different it's, it's very similar yeah, there's like a little deeper level of nuance that I want to get into. So, like, let, let's say that we we feed um, AI a data set of like just Skrillex tracks, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden it cranks out all of these things like Skrillex tracks from like like 2010 to 2014, for example, like that super kind of growly kind of dubstep sound that he pioneered back then. Um, so you feed uh, AI a bunch of tracks of that flavor from Skrillex and it kind of spits you out sound design or however it supports you in making a track that sounds exactly like that ethical or no I would say no but that's what I that's what I was saying earlier I think the artistic integrity and the artistic component of AI stuff is curating that data set I think like if you just mm. pick Skrillex tracks from 2010 to 2014 to where it made indiscernible tracks from actual Skrillex 2010 to 2014 tracks, then yeah, that's that's shitty. Yeah. But if okay. you pick like uh, Skrillex tracks from 2010 to 2014, Scream tracks from like 2008, uh, The Weeknd tracks from like 2020, like Res tracks from 2015, Dead Mouse tracks from 2010, like, and then you combine all of them and see what it creates, then I think that that's your artistic choice to have combined those specific things and then on top of that if you especially like put in some of your own music in there and or if you train models on all of them and then create some interpolated mash at different percentages of like each model then i think that that's pretty reasonable and decent i don't think it's hurting any of those artists in particular and i think it's creating a new piece of art that has value mm -hmm. what if any one of those artists that you just listed let's say dead mouse has an issue with it He's like, I don't want my tracks being ran through AI so other people can kind of bite my style. Well, I Does mean, that change the ethical conversation for you, in your opinion? Yeah, I would say so. Like, if it's pissing somebody off, then you're hurting somebody. And yeah. then, yes, I would say so. Okay. Uh, but, I mean, regardless of AI or not, people are making stuff that sounds like Dead Mouse anyway without AI. So I don't see why he would draw the line there, you know? <laughs> Fair. But yeah, I know. Yeah, it is a gray area, but I think that stance of just like if you're hurting somebody, then just don't do it is a pretty reasonable uh, stance to take whilst the gray area thing is in play, whilst we don't have any hard and fast rules here. Yeah. yeah I, I guess we do that. have some hard and fast rules because Drake took that stance where he like, I think he wanted to, I don't know what he said, he wanted to sue someone or something or they took down a Drake model. Or I, I can't remember exactly what happened, but then Grimes responded by saying, Use my voice all you want. You just have to give me 50% of the royalties of the music that you release, <laughs> which I thought was pretty clever. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, if it's pissing Drake off, it's pissing Drake off, so don't do it. But um, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of artists out there, I think, who would be pro AI and fine with you training models on their stuff. I mean, I'm pretty public about the fact that I'm fine with anyone training anything on any of my stuff. I don't think it, like, takes away from what I do because I'm already doing another thing because ai is only good as the data that it's trained on 
And the data that's out there that exists of mine is not as good as the data I think that I have that's about to come out. And it will always be one step behind in that way. Mm. So I think mm -hmm. it'll be fine. But basically what my music is at all points in time, like each new album is basically all of the influence and shit that I had before it with the new influences that I've gained in the last couple of years, or the, which is basically what AI does as well. It's like, yeah, anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what's your, what's your stance on it? Like ethically, do you think it's completely not okay to train models on anything and generate stuff? Um, and it depends why you're doing it, right? Like whether you're trying to generate something to sell it or whether you're just doing it because it's fun. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with, with, with pretty much everything that you've said and the positions you've taken on it. And uh, like particularly that piece, like if it's hurting someone, then just don't do it. Like I, I respect that a lot. And I think that requires like a high level of, of just self integrity to even like consider and track and take care of, right? Like I actually don't think a lot of people will use AI that way. They'll just be kind of like, oh, I'm going to go feed anything that I want, kind of like a kid in a candy store and just kind of go into mm -hmm. town. And, and, um, so I don't think a lot of people will, will hold that, that self standard. And, and like you said, that there's a gray area, right? So there's not really like a frame or structure or like a set of principles in place that kind of can hold and maintain the integrity. So it's very much like anarchy. It's like artistic anarchy and, um, you know, for, for better or for worse, I think I'll just come back to one of the things that I said earlier. And it's that I think there's a light, light, sh light side to it and a shadow side. And I think mm -hmm. there's going to be some in incredibly profound uh, things that are enabled by AI. It's just like, it's insane to even think about, you know, like explaining someone, explaining to someone 20 years ago, like what AI is capable of today is just unheard of. Like the thought mm -hmm. of like drawing on a sheet of paper, like a kindergarten level kind of like crooked line framework of a website, taking a photo of it and having AI spit you out website code that makes a beautiful, pristine version of it is insane to think about. And um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's like, it's, it's a, it's a speeding bullet train that's not going to be slowed down. And it's only going to get better and faster and stronger. And that'll just unleash further and further, like infinite potential of creative powers with humans. And it will really be up to the individual human and how they use it and their own internal ethical and moral compass that will influence if it's uh, deeply of service or if it'll, do, if it'll do harm or not. Like to me, it's not about the technology. Right. It's about, it's about the human behavior behind the technology that I feel concerned about. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, are you curious to hear some uh, some sounds that I've generated with it? Bring it. All right, let me see if I can share my sound here. Oh, God damn it, dude, it's so hard. All right, here we go. All right, sick. It's hard to click on things in this website. The bottom like tab is all broken and shit. All right, let's see. Uh, I'll share this. This is just my audio player. Um, if I play something here, can you hear it? Can you hear that or no? No. No? All right, one sec. How do I fix this? I think I might just have to... Um, I think I might just have to switch this to be something. Which one? Maybe default? Let's see. What about now? Can you hear that? Still no. Oh, God damn it. Well, I don't know how to figure that out on this specific platform. Uh, probably my mic is what I have to change. Well, fuck it. I'll figure this out later. Um, I'll send you some stuff that I'm, I'm cool. sure you'll be Yeah, I'm interested super interested to hear, to hear it. Because it. it's actually like the sounds that it creates are pretty high quality, though they all have a fair bit of like white, white noise on them. So it's good for things like snares and like dirty basses and stuff because it's the way that it works is through diffusion, right? So it like it noises an image a bunch of times and then it denoises it a bunch of times to get back to the thing. That's how mm -hmm. diffusion and all this AI shit, shit works, which is why all the images looks like sort of blurry as well because um, they all like come from Gaussian blur stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of the sounds sound a little bit like that way, but I think that's, that quality is going to be increased over the next, you know, 
month or two or year or however long it takes but i think it will get to a point where it like even the voices sound like that now you can hear all these artifacts and shit yeah yeah for so sure they're not perfect now but they're definitely like uh for certain stuff like snares that are is inherently noisy anyway it's really good for that kind of stuff um but yeah. have you seen the new season of black mirror yet <clears throat> no i meant to be i meant to watch it but i'm trying to finish the sopranos first yeah, so there's there's an, there's an there's an episode where the premise of the episode is there's this person who like works in a corporate office and all of a sudden they have to fire someone. And uh it's like a, the 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 meta thinking that was applied to the screenwriting of this episode is actually quite quite brilliant. Uh, so this this corporate executive fires somebody and there's like this kind of like embarrassing humiliating exit from the office that the fired person has to make. And then all of a sudden, the exact same day, the version of Netflix inside the story releases a, a, a series about the corporate executive who just fired the person, but puts a super dramatic twist on it where she's like, was just like such a dickhead to the person that she fired and just like made her look like a total asshole. And like, that's the theme of the episode is there's like a show about her life that starts to go on Netflix in real time and there's nothing she can do about it. And her boyfriend finds out that she's cheated on him because it shows up in this Netflix show and it just <laughs> kind of like is like this expose of like the toxic things in her life, but dramatized. It's a really, really brilliant episode and um, and had me thinking about how uh, AI is going to be applied to Hollywood in like five, 10 years. You know, there, mm -hmm. there's going to be a point where like films will be able to be made completely based on AI generated images using <laughs> Hollywood triple A list names and their likenesses, their visual, the voice, and it's going to look real or close to real. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it just has me thinking like, you know, 10 years from now, like having an actor and creating a physical film set in an actual environment somewhere might actually even be redundant. Mm. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, at the end of the day, is that a bad thing? I mean, people who love to act can still act if they want. Um, and maybe without having that like uh, reward or risk of like doing a bad job on set with other good actors and stuff is part of it kind of like playing a set is like you don't want to fuck up like there's a whole different thing to playing a set in front of people than just doing it by yourself at home um but i mean i'm sure there's roles that some people hate doing like extras right in the background <laughs> yeah like, they can yeah. be ai generated <laughs> or, uh, you know, somebody yeah, you like let's say uh you know no one wants to jump out of a fucking car like i mean a stuntman will do it but i don't know if they want to do it maybe they do maybe they're <laughs> adrenaline junkies but that can all be ai too you know yeah it, it reminds me of a scene in the recent James Bond film where uh, the film was, was scheduled to come out right, right at the start of the pandemic. And then they, the, they delayed the release of the film because they wanted to you know, make their money back in theaters. And so they waited like a year and a half after the film was supposed to be released to release it. And at that point, there was a scene in the film that there, where there's a, a shot with a BlackBerry phone in it. And BlackBerry paid an arm and a leg to have their product squarely featured in the, in the film. But because of the delay of the film, the, f the original version of the film displayed an older, irrelevant product. Oh, and so gosh. they actually had to call in the entire acting team to reshoot that scene with the newest BlackBerry phone that oh, was geez. available a year and a half later. And so something wow. like that would just be, you know, kind of yeah. uh, obsolete. Just AI that, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Just train a data set on the rest of the film and all of the takes that they didn't use from all of the actors that would probably be plenty of data to do it. Yeah. Assuming that the that the AI model was easily trained and able to generate that stuff. But yeah, that good point. Yeah, I think it's going to have a lot of good use cases. But yeah, probably there's going to be some shitheads out there that, you know, like the person who releases the demo track who's also going to do this shit with AI, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I mean... There's always people like that. You're never going to stop that. Yeah. There's always going to be shitty people out there. But hopefully most people, like they did, most people do now, will use all of these uh, tools out there for good and to do cool, creative, interesting things with them. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, man, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. It was good to catch up. And, yeah, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and chatting with me for an hour. 
And uh, yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, likewise, Bill. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to catch All up. Right. Yeah, man. Cheers. Take care.